morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Do things a little differently here, though. I have, like, these blinders on, okay? So I can't see anything past these aisles. So if you're sitting over in these, just kidding. Uh, if you're sitting over in these aisles, you've got to move in, okay? Now, what you can do, if you're not, you go ahead and just put, take up one of the ropes. That way you don't have to worry about the deep cleaning. Just pick up one of the ropes in one of these things, and then you can sit in your regular seat. You can leave your stuff in your regular seat if that's where you're going to sit. Or if you want to sit wherever, if you want to stake out a really good seat right now, now's the chance to do it. Um, but, yeah, just go ahead and scoot over. That way you can, perfect, awesome. Um, that gives me a little more opportunity to... See everyone, because I like to have interaction. Oh, Andy, someone's on the line. I don't know. Just kidding. Zach, can you kind of rein that guy in? I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome. I am so uh, encouraged by this opportunity. I really am. Um, we've done a lot of classes. Over the 15, 16 years of Christ or Hope, we've actually, and I, we never actually have done a class on the attributes of God. And uh, we've talked, obviously, we've talked a lot about the attributes of God, but not a class actually dedicated um, to that. And so I, I think this will be a real good complement to the bookends um, class, which focuses on living in light of our righteousness in Christ. That's the first bookend, and who we are in Christ, and then uh, living in light of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, which is the second bookend. And this class will really um, help us understand what righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. What does it mean that God is righteous? Uh, we'll talk about some key attributes of God I think will be very helpful. And so this class is going to kind of step back, kind of step back and give us a big picture of who is this God whom we uh, uh, serve and give us a greater understanding. And I hope it's, it'll give you a, a greater love for God. Uh, I trust even this morning, you're going to have your synapses pressed and stretched and of your brain. Uh, we're going to talk about the infinity and eternity of God this morning. Okay, so we're gonna be, you're going to get stretched, uh, which is what we should be. But I believe it's super practical, super practical in our daily uh, Christian lives. So let me read the course description. This is what it was in the bulletin. I think it's in the bulletin again this time. Uh, it's not on your notes, but here's what it is. It's, if we are to glorify God, we must be growing in knowing and understanding him. This class will focus on a different attribute of God each week, seeking to help us grow in knowing him so we can deepen our love and worship of him. Uh, there will be an emphasis on applying a growing understanding of God to daily life. That's what this is all about, uh, knowing about God so that we can live uh, for his glory. And I have some notes, and I don't make any pretension. I'm going to get through all those notes today. We're going to do the best we can uh, on that. Uh, how do you talk about infinity in 45, 50 minutes? I don't know, but we're going to try. Uh, and I'm going to be teaching a fair number of these sessions, but a number of other men in our church, Alex Rapay, Brent, Zach, uh, Mark Baker, Gus Nolmeyer, we have it scheduled out till May. Um, we'll be teaching different ones. Um, so I think it'll be really helpful, really encouraging um, for them and for you as well. So I'm looking forward to sitting under their um, teaching. And, and we're really just going to be hitting the high points of the attributes of God. This is the, this is the high points uh, of what God is like. I have in my library some massive volumes on, on just the attributes of God. And, and so this is kind of, I trust this will whet your appetite. So, you're like, oh, I want to know more about God. And it'll cause you to, I'll even mention a little bit later, some resources that will help you um, in that. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the class. We're going to talk overall is about why should we study the attributes of God and how should we do that? Why and how um, should we do that? And then we'll begin to talk about the attributes of God being infinite uh, and ultimately infinite in all of his attributes. That's why we're going to look at that one and eternal, which is directly connected uh, to that. Okay, sound good? You ready? Okay, let me open our time in a word of prayer and we'll get started. God, what a, what a subject um, for us to to talk about, and even as we enter into this, we, we think of when uh, Moses in the wilderness, he came upon the, the, the burning bush, and it was something that caused awe in him. He wasn't aware of what it was, and then you called him to take off his um, sandals. He knelt down and fell on his face because he was on holy ground. And, and so even as we do this, um, we don't do this lightly. Um, even as Solomon Ecclesiastes, he talks about not coming uh, flippantly into your presence. And so as we talk about your attributes, um, we do that with a, a sense of awe. We do that with a great sense of fear and respect um, as we consider what you have revealed about yourself. And so, God, we would ask that your spirit would work 
um, to help us understand more what you are like, but then how that has implications in our daily lives, particularly how, how it affects how we view you and our relationship with you and, and then how we live um, for your glory. So we trust you for that, that you would do that work in your name. Amen. Well, if you have the notes, you can see I have some discussion questions in there, okay? What discussion questions mean is I don't do all the talking, okay? Just in case you didn't know what that meant. Uh, So what I want to do is I have a question, and I'm going to have you turn to your neighbors right around you and talk about this question, okay? And then we'll open it up and talk a little bit about it from the the floor, okay? So the discussion, discussion question is why is it important for Christians to thoughtfully consider and study the attributes of God, okay? Can you ask a question? Uh, why is it important for Christians to thoughtfully consider and study the attributes of God? Turn to the people right around you and talk about that question, okay? Hey, Victor, did you get some notes? There's some notes right back there on the table. Everyone get the notes back there on the table? Actually, Victor. You want to grab it and uh, take some up to Dave and Carolyn up in the balcony? Can you grab a set of the? Victor will come up and get you a set of the notes, okay? Either that or you can parachute down if you want. There's plenty of room down here. We don't bite. Okay, they're coming down. Okay, Victor, you got to come in. You can't sit over there. Got to sit in the middle. Come on. Everyone? That's okay. You can throw, throw, all, throw all kinds of books out. That's good. You can stake out the seats. That's one of the advantages of coming to early class. You can just kind of come in closer so we can talk to each other. That'd be great. Okay. Why? What did you come up with? Why is it important for us to study the attributes of God, to thoughtfully consider these? What are some reasons? Why? Yeah. Jack. Yeah. Those who understand and know me. Yeah. So just for the simple fact that the Lord delights in that. Yeah, that's awesome observation. God delights. The God of glory delights when we study him. When we, we can't worship a God we don't know, so when we, we are enamored, that's, that's a great observation that Prophet Jeremiah made. Excellent, excellent. Um, God is glorified. Just, that's for no other reason we should do this, right? What else? Why? Why should we consider and thoughtfully look at the, the attributes of God, what God is like? Yeah, Christy. The more we know him, like Okay. Yeah, the more we know him, uh, the more we can uh, trust him, the more we'll be in awe of him. Because if you don't know what God's like, right, you can't, you can't worship him. You can't worship him correctly. Okay, good. What else? Yeah. Yeah. He has these amazing attributes. The list you could keep going, Eric. The list is endless, and so and we can't be like that unless we begin to study him. Okay. Good. Anyone else? Reasons why? Yeah, Birch. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. 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 Good. Excellent, Birch. That we come up with an idea that we think something means, and sometimes it's just really quick. We just say, oh, I know what that word means, or I know what it means that, I know it means that God's sovereign. I know it means that God's righteous. I know it means that God's holy. I know it means that God's eternal. When we need to lean into Scripture, right, so that we really understand what does God's Word say about himself. Because what we're going to study is not what do, we're not going to spend a lot of time at all, what do men say about God? It's what does God say about God, right? Um, even the names of God. Every name of God is from who? God. He named himself. Uh, all of his names are from himself. So also the attributes of God. God is the one that has declared these. And so that's an excellent um, observation. I have some quotes down there in your notes that kind of help uh, uh, 
direct your thinking. Uh, the first one by C.H. Spurgeon, called The Prince of Preachers uh, in England. Uh, great quote. Um, he, was introducing, he was introducing a sermon series on the attributes of God, and this is what he, he said. He said, nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself into the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. It is to that subject that I invite you this morning. Isn't that awesome? I mean, uh, amazing that here, here is what will comfort the soul. It's a, it's a grand view of God. Any idea how old Spurgeon was when he wrote that? When he said that? He was born in 1834. He was 20 years old when he said that. Amazing, amazing. Um, but I love that statement, nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. This is what it's about, right? Studying God. Who is God? What is our God like? And oftentimes as elders, as we talk and as I work with Zach, that we want our worship services to be very, very vertical. Very vertical. Our lives are very horizontal, right? All these concerns and cars and houses and taxes and food, whatever, all these things that we're concerned about on the horizontal, and yet we want, when we come here to Christ Bible Church, that our, in a sense, our focus will be very vertical. It has to do with the kind of songs that, that Zach selects, kind of has to do with how we focus on the reading of God's Word and prayer and, and how we preach God's Word. It's, we want it to be very, very um, vertical. Because what? The vertical gives perspective to the horizontal, right? If our vertical is right, then, then we have the perspective we need to deal um, with the, the horizontal. And I love what he says. We need to be lost in his immensity. Isn't that awesome? We need to be lost in the immensity of God because that takes away the thing, that takes away the struggle with the issues in our lives that we don't have an answer to. We can't explain. We can't answer the whys. So many things have happened in life. And yet when we're lost in God's immensity, that's what gives us security. That's what gives us trust. And that's where we want to, to be. And then a quote from A.W. Tozer um, from his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I put that in the little bulletin blur because it's so key. For this reason, the gravest question, the most serious question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. That is so, so true. And we live in probably the most pragmatic culture of all time. Just tell me what to do, how to fix this situation. What should I do for my family or, or home or car or what or work? What do I do? In this saying, there is something that has to be before we get so wrapped up in the pragmatic, and that is what do we think about God? Who is he? Because what we think about God affects all, all of that. And I love that idea is we move toward our mental image of God. And scriptures talk about that the mankind creates their own image of God, and then they move toward that. Look at our society. Our society defines what kind of God they want to have. Most people, most of your neighbors will say, yeah, I believe in God, but they've created a God. They've created a God, and society has helped them to do that. It created a God that's very small, has no demands on them at all, and they can basically do whatever they want, and he, they, he's not that concerned about them. They have no idea of a God that, that wants to be glorified through their life. They have no idea that their ultimate purpose in life, the only way they can have true purpose, their family can have true purpose, is to live for the glory of a great and grand God. They have no idea. That's why we need to be overwhelmed with who God um, is. And then uh, Tozer also wrote in that same book, a couple pages later, he said, in my opinion, it is my opinion that the Christian conception of God current in these middle years of the 20th century is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God and actually to constitute for professed believers something amounting to a moral 
calamity. You know what year he wrote that? I don't remember it. I was born, but I don't remember it. 1961. I was one years old. Um, He wrote this in 1961, almost 60 years ago. Now think about today of that statement. If he would say that at that time about our society's view of God, what about today? Whether it's gone so, so, so far um, in that direction. And it's a moral calamity. Our low view of God and our Christian walk, we, our Christian walk can never rise above our view of God. It can never. And so that's why we need to focus on who is God? Who is this grand and great God um, that we um, serve? So that's the why. Does that motivate you and help you understand? Yes. This, there's nothing more important that we could do on a, on a Sunday morning than to focus on who our gr- God is and to be overwhelmed by his greatness and to look at him uh, in, in detail um, for that. What's an attribute of God? What is an attribute of God? Because uh, this course is about the attributes of God, and so it's important that we talk about, well, what is that? What is an attribute of God? We talk about attributes and use of other things, but what is it as it relates to God? And I have there in your notes, the divine attributes are what we know to be true of God. In the most accurate sense, God does not possess certain attributes as distinct qualities. Rather, they are what God has revealed to be true of himself. Now, I'm going to start pressing you to think carefully and to to consider um, these things. Uh, We can only know what God has chosen to reveal to us. And God's revelation to us is always limited. By that, I mean it's always limited so we as finite humans can understand. If God just revealed himself in an unlimited way, we would be gone because he is, he is so magnificent. We couldn't conceive of his greatness. So always his revelation in the scriptures, this is a limited revelation. Limited in the sense it's limited to human language. It's limited to what a human can understand, even though it's so far past our understanding. It's still a limited. It's fully accurate. It's fully complete of what God wants us to know, but it's limited. It's limited in that sense. In God's word, there are no list of attributes where I'm going to say, okay, now we're just going to go through this passage, and we're going to talk about all these attributes of God. No, we're going to pull from all of Scripture on, on what God's attributes are. Uh, but these, you can't say, well, um, for example, our society, people that say they believe in God. Well, I, I believe in God, but I believe, and then when they say I believe in God, they're going to tell you the God they've invented. I believe in a God that's so loving that he could never send anyone to hell. I believe in a God that's so loving um, that, you know, and then they go on and on to to redefine um, who God is. When God is not up for our definition, it's ultimately who God has declared himself to be. And so I put that little picture of a a diamond, because that's the way I like to think about the attributes of God. God is the, the magnificent, in a sense, eternal, infinite diamond, uh, magnificent. And attributes, they're merely a facet. You know, a round diamond has, what, 58 facets on it that you can look at? Well, God has infinitely more a, a, um, uh, facets than that. But it's a facet, it's just a different angle. When you look at a diamond, you look at a different angle, and every different angle you look at it, you, it sparkles in a different way. It's, it's amazing. And that's what we're going to do. We're just going to look at a little different angle. Okay, let's look at God this way. Look at God this way. It's not like we're seeing a different God or a different character of God. You're just looking at a different angle at God, the same God. He is who he is. And so all of his, all of his attributes are all of him. You can't separate them off um, in any way. Sometimes his attributes are called his perfections uh, to emphasize that they're perfect and uh, inherently characterize a God who's perfect. Uh, that second bullet there, um, the divine, uh, or first bullet, the divine attributes are what we know to be true of, of God. Um, everything we know about God is an aspect of one of his attributes. Um, now you say, well, why do we talk about the attributes of God? Why would we talk about the attributes of God? You say, well, let's talk about God. Well, you can't just sit in a corner and hum and just think God, like that word God. You have to think about truth about God. And so when you think about attributes of God, these are pulling out from the scriptures what the Bible talks about who that God is. You cannot think about God ultimately unless in some way you're connecting it to his attributes and who he is. 
his righteousness, his holiness, his faithfulness, his sovereignty. Even this morning when you prayed to God, you were appealing to his attributes. You were considering his attributes, his faithfulness. So you cannot consider God truly unless you consider his attributes, the truth of what Scripture has said about him. So an attribute is not part of what, uh, is not part of God. It's, it's not how, it's, it is who God is. They're in that next bullet. So you, you can't divide off God's attributes and say, well, that's God. No, this is God, and all of his attributes relate um, to him. Uh, God doesn't consist of a bunch of different parts. And that's why I'm real careful as we teach this class. Well, you know, one Sunday we're going to talk about today um, his uh, infinite, his eternality. We'll talk about his sovereignty. We'll talk about his faithfulness. We'll talk about his goodness. We'll talk about his love. We'll talk about his grace and his mercy. But we can't peel any of those off and, and, and give the impression that God's a bunch of parts. No, God is God. We're just trying to understand him better, and this is just an angle. This is just a facet that we're trying to look at through to, to see him in a new and a, in a fresh way. And, and all of his attributes complement each other. Do you understand why people get in trouble when they try to pull one attribute and they say, that's God, and then, well, that contradicts. Well, God is sovereign, but, you know, he also holds man responsible. See, those contradict. No, at, what that is is we're pulling off an attribute of God and not looking at, the, at, at God as himself through that attribute. And it's very important that you not do that. Otherwise, you're gonna, you'll find some things that are contradictory. Why? Because God is so far past our understanding. Um, we'll see that in a moment. The next bullet, if an attribute is something true of God, it is also something that we can conceive as being true of him. God being infinite must possess attributes about which we know nothing. I'll go ahead and read the second bullet, and then we'll talk about this. Next two. In the vastness of the divine being are attributes of which we know nothing and which we can have no comprehension. Is this on top of the next page? just as the attributes of grace and mercy have no personal meaning for the angels. Next, well, there are surely aspects of God's being which he has not revealed even to his ransomed children. They're like the far side of the moon, which we know is there, but which has never been explored and has no identifiable meaning for mankind. We cannot discover what God has not revealed. As wonderful as the 66 books of God's word are, and as much as we can never even plumb the depths of this, and yet this doesn't even come close to, ha- to revealing everything there is about God. I wrote about that little metaphor in here. You remember in uh, Peter when it talks about how the angels long to look at our salvation? How can sinners, how can sinners become right with God? Because when, an an- when angels fell, they were done. Angels were elect not to fall. They cannot be redeemed. Christ did not become an angel. So they can't conceive of what, what is grace, what is mercy. So also for us, there are no doubt many other, any other attributes or aspects of God's character that, that we can't know. Why else do you think we need eternity, right? Because that's how long it's going to take. And when you've been there for a billion years, you're going to need to be there a billion more years because there's a, there's a billion more things about God and his greatness and his awesomeness that you are going to be uh, under, growing an understanding of. Far more that's in here, right? Uh, and that will be the central joy of eternity, growing uh, to know God, uh, being overwhelmed by his greatness and his glory. But praise God, he has revealed attributes in this book that we can understand. And it's the ones that he wants us to understand so that we can, one, worship him, and then out of that, that we can bring him great glory. So that's a big answer to a short question, what's an attribute of God? Uh, But does it begin to help you understand? I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon um, where you you begin to gaze, and I, I, I realize about Oh, about 30, 25 years ago, that I, I actually am afraid of heights. I didn't realize I was before. I remember a glacier on top of a tall cliff. I'm like, whoa, I don't want to get close to that. But like in a Grand Canyon, you're like, whoa, there's, a, there's an awe, right? You know, now some of you, yeah, you'll get close to the edge. You'll want to climb over the rail and get even closer to the edge, some of you. But most of us, normal people, uh, stand back because that awe is like, whoa, that is amazing. And God has created humans to long to be in awe, right? He's created us, that, right? Why do they create those motion pictures that are epics? Because we want to be in awe. And what greater thing for us to be in awe than to look at God? 
to gaze into the, the chasm, the Grand Canyon, not of some earthly thing, but of the, the greatness of our, our God and his glory. That's where we'll be overwhelmed. That's what God created us for. That's what we're going to be doing for all eternity. And so we want a taste of this. It's like a Costco. I want to give you a sampler um, of that. And so you want more, and you want more, and you long um, for that. So those are the attributes. That's an attribute of God. Well, I have another discussion question in your notes there. What are some challenges for us in seeking to understand the attributes of God? Okay, is that the top of the next page in your notes? I, my notes are a little different page. Okay. Uh, what are some challenges? Okay, why don't you just turn to the people right around you uh, and talk about that question. What are some challenges that we have uh, in seeking to understand the attributes of God? Go. Then I'll have you show. Joe, why don't you just go back a little bit there. So they can, there you go. Okay, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the uh, challenges um, for us as we seek to, to know and to grow and learning about the attributes of God? The flesh. What do you mean by that, Eric? Okay, yeah. We're finite, right? We are finite humans. And because of that, there are built-in challenges. Uh, next uh, week uh, in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see where the majority of that finiteness comes from, particularly in the fall, when Adam and Eve, they fall into sin, and they, they receive the knowledge of good and evil, but that doesn't make them know God any better. It makes them know God less, amazingly. So yeah, we're, we're flesh. We're human. Okay, good. What else? What are the challenges for us to, to know God and his attributes? Okay. Yeah, we are so immersed with the messages of this world and ultimately the enemy that and it becomes a, it's so systemic to us. It affects our thinking so much. It's so inherent with us. We don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. And yeah, we're just bombarded. It's just the way we are. So it's, it's a battle to think about God correctly because we are bent to think about him incorrectly. And not just because of our flesh, like Eric mentioned, but also because of the influences of the, of the world. And it's... It's, most of the time it's subtle, and sometimes it's very blatant um, about what our society would indicate about God, and it does affect us. It does wear us down. We don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. We become overwhelmed um, with that. Good. What else? Other limitations. Why it's difficult. Why it's a challenge to know God. Is that Yeah, Joe. For myself, there's like seasons of life. Okay. You threw out Tozer mentioned that. Mainly, was it Tozer? Yes, Adam Tozer. 20 yeah. So oh, it's virgin, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're overrun with life. We're distracted, right? We're distracted with all kinds of things. I can't think about God. I just got to figure out how to feed my kids and change diapers or whatever it is and make a living and get, make sure the car keeps running and all that, right? It's, it's, it's bombarding you. There's not a little voice in your head that's saying, what are you thinking about God right now? 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 There's not that little voice, but there's a lot of little, sometimes they're literal voices in some of your homes that are shouting, please, I need this, mommy, daddy, um, or your boss, or whatever it is. There's all kinds of voices that are shouting at you, 
and uh, in some seasons of life particularly. You're right. Our lives are filled with distractions, but God knows that. He knows that. Yeah. Zach. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 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 We are very finite. You said that we're very finite. Um, we just plain we get tired. You know, I. You know, you're just trying to think, and about these are deep things to think about, and so it's it's hard. Um, we're, we're tired, and we're just uh, need rest, and. Uh, yeah, it's, I like what you said, our tent is falling down, and it is, you know, and, but Lord willing, as our physical tent's falling down, our, our love for the Lord, if we are cultivating that, will grow even deeper and deeper, you know, that's what should happen, um, which I think is of the Lord, that it gives perspective as, you, as we age and we go through, um, things get more difficult as we age, Lord willing, for a believer, because they walk with the Lord more intimately, I think Marge was a, Marge Ackley was a great great example of that, that she was more joyful, not less. Even when life got more painful, even when life got more difficult, she became more joyful. Why? Because her love for God, as she gazed at him, caused that. And I think that's, that's, but if we're not, if we're not, and Lord save us from it, but that we will become bitter old people that are angry at life and angry at people that we think have harmed us, angry at our government, angry at everything. And that's what we'll become. Even Christians can become that way if we are not pressing into our great God and uh, letting him transform our character to be um, like him. I think there's, uh, so you've hit a number of the things that I listed. Sinfulness, we're just sinful, right? We're Christians, but if we know the Lord, but we're still sinful, right? We still have things that pull us away. Remember Romans 7, Paul said, why, why do I do what I don't want to do? Why don't I do what I do want to do? Why don't, well, you know, it's, it's because we're, we're wrestling with this flesh, like Eric said. We're wrestling with that. And so it's going to be a battle. This is part of the spiritual battle of fighting against that tendency. You know, I'm just going to kind of stay at the Christian level. I am, no, that God would have us to lean into understanding who God um, is. I think also that I... Uh, and particularly in our, our age, our generation, we tend to have a very anti-intellectual bent um, where what we're talking, I mean, probably already you're like, whoa, whoa, this is like Sunday morning early and I, we just got here barely clothed in our right minds. Maybe not in our right minds, but clothed. We're here and now you're throwing in us all this stuff and we, we can tend to have an anti-intellectual um, bias where we no, just just tell me what to do. And no, the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't just tell you what to do. It first tells you who God is, and then in light of who he is, who he wants you to be in light of that. But you cannot do what God wants you to do unless you're gazing at who God is. And so it's going to press you. It's going to stretch you. And every one of you can think about God far more than you give yourself credit for. Because the enemies want to think, you can't figure that out. Uh, yeah, we can't figure out the Trinity, but let's lean into it. Let's gaze at the triune God. Let's be overwhelmed by him. And so I want to encourage you to, to even say, well, yeah, I didn't have a very good education. I didn't study hard in school. I can't read very well. You know, no, none of that stuff matters. You're saved by grace. And God wants you to lean into understanding the deep, deep things of him. That's one of the points of this course is to help you into that, help you into that. Um, I, and we're just going to do it. Um, my dad had a real uh, novel uh, method for teaching me how to swim. It's called throw you into the deep end and see if you survive. Now, he knew I was going to survive, but I didn't know if I was going to survive. He just took it. And, I mean, I went, to, I went to swim lessons. I don't know how many times. I never learned how to swim. So he said, okay, John, we're going to learn to swim today. We're going to learn to swim today. And so he just threw me in. Well, actually, he was in there. He, he made me jump into him, but and then I learned to swim. Amazing. Um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive into the deep end. We're talking about small thing about infinity today of God, eternality um, of God. So we're going to look at that. So there's some challenges, but we're not letting that push us away. We're letting us depend on God as we face those challenges. So how can we learn about the attributes of God there in your notes as we continue on? How can we do that? Um, from uh, uh, MacArthur and Mayhew's great, um, it's a biblical doctrine. It's a summary of all biblical doctrine, great tool to have in your home. But in that, um, they say, since these perfections characterize God, talking about the attributes of God, they cannot be discovered and defined by man, especially in his depravity, for man himself cannot know God completely. Rather, God must reveal himself for man assuredly to know anything about God. 
including his perfections. God has revealed himself in nature, but humanity corrupts that knowledge. Only the Bible gives accurate information about God and his perfections. Even this information is not exhaustive, but it is true because it is written in the inspired text of Scripture. So this course is all about what God says about God, right? Not what me or anybody else, any books. It's, it's all about what God says about God, and uh, that's our, our focus. So to know God, we must immerse ourselves in his word. What does he say on his word? I love Psalm 119, 18. This is a, a passage I often quote. I actually have it on my template from every week when I study to prepare um, for preaching. Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes, then I may behold wonderful things from thy law. And that's a prayer um, from the psalmist there. And what is the, the most wonderful thing you could ever observe from God's word? What is it? God himself. God himself. So when you pray that prayer, what, what, the greatest way God could answer that is to help you see him in a new and a, in a fresh way. Uh, very, very key. Psalm 119.38, uh, establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. What is it that will produce a reverence for God? Is it just sitting in a corner and trying to work that up on your own? No, it's gazing at God and his word and then praying these kind of prayers. God, open my eyes. But God can produce a reverence and awe of him as you look at his um, scripture. And then John 17, three, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That little word know, and I know Jim Moore has often described that it's, it's, there's two Greek words for know, oida, which means to know intellectual knowledge, which is important. But then there's an, uh, a gnosko, it's the knowledge of intimacy. It's even used as a, the marriage relationship. Uh, but this is to know God, to intimately commune with God, that's eternal life. Eternal life isn't just living in, in heaven and enjoying you know, the, the, the streets of gold and the mansions and all that stuff and doing whatever we want. No, the, the joy of eternal life is knowing God. And God wants you to lean into that now, now, to press into that now. So every day in your times in the Word, what's the goal? To know God. Read the Bible to know God. Uh, not because someone might ask me. No, to know God. Um, that's, that's our goal. That's for eternity. That will be our purpose. And so that should be um, our goal, even in the, the here and now. So that's the introduction. What are we going to be looking at? The attributes of God. That, and I trust that, I trust two goals. I trust that you're, like Joe said, in a good way, overwhelmed. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. You know, I better tighten my seatbelt a little tighter. This is amazing. Whoa, this is too much. But then also that you would in, in a, have a taste and say, oh, Lord, that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I long for. I, I want to know you in a greater way. I, I don't want to be satisfied with a, a small view of you. I, I don't want to plateau my Christian life. So I trust that both things, you're, you're kind of scared, you know, but then, you know, it's like you're, you got your parachute on, you're about to jump out of the plane, you're like, ah, but you're ready to jump, you know, and, and trust that, that you have a, kind of both, both of those. Any questions, thoughts, as we, before we look into the, the first um, attributes that we're going to look at? Questions, perspectives. A couple resources before we get into that um, that are helpful. This is books. Uh, Knowledge of the Holy. I've already got a couple of the quotes. Mine's totally worn out. I had to rebind it. Uh, yeah, it's, this one isn't from 1961. I'm not that old. Um, but it's pretty close. No, it's not. Uh, but this is a great tool. He just goes through the attributes of God in a very, very readable way. This is, this is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, Knowing God, I know as a church we've read through this in a while back, but J.I. Packer's Knowing God. And this, was def- this one's definitely heavier, but it's very readable. Uh, I mean, this is an amazing book. Uh, I don't want to say you're in sin if you haven't read this book, but it's a key, key book to grow you in your awareness of God. There's another one that's a, I don't have it um, here with me, but it's a, it's a, uh, at, by A.W. Pink. It's a, it's a PDF. You just search it. It's right online. You can print it out if you want to read it. It's called Attributes of God by A.W. Pink. It's called The Attributes of God. It's written in the 1930s. Um, Attributes of God by A.W. Um, Pink. And then there's two classic, um, it's called, uh, this, is about, this, this is just The Attributes of God, um, Stephen Sharnock. Puritan um, wrote very, very powerfully on that. I wouldn't start with this one. This is definitely harder um, reading. I would start with the knowledge of the holy. Um, that's the first one. And then probably go to Pink and then uh, uh, G.I. Packer um, on that. So those are some great resources I'd encourage you to get. Okay? Any questions on that? Well, let's 
just in the little bit of time we have left, let's talk about what it means that, that God is infinite. God is eternal. Okay? I have a starting question there. Why are you starting here, John? That's the question. Why is the infinite, infiniteness of God a good starting point for studying his attributes? Why do we start in talking about the fact that God is infinite? Okay, go ahead and turn to the people right around you and talk about why is this a good starting point to talk about the attributes of God. Okay, why, why is this a good starting point? Why is it good for us? To, we can start at a lot of different places. Um, obviously, we could start at God's holiness. We could start at God's sovereignty. And those are all good places to start. No, nothing wrong with that, but I'm choosing. Just, I'm doing the class, so I can choose where we're going to start. <laughs> so uh, we're starting here. Why, why is this a good place to start? Yeah, Paul. Okay. 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 So this attribute of infiniteness affects all of the other attributes of God. Yeah. Yeah, like a backdrop. It, a lot of them, like you said, like we said, they, a lot of them cling to this. It's a, it's a backdrop of all of them because the reality is, is. God is infinite in all of his attributes, right? Infinite. He's infinitely holy. He's infinitely righteous. He's infinitely gracious. He's infinitely sovereign. So I, I like the way you explain that exactly. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the backdrop. It's, it touches all of them, okay? What else? What else? Yeah. So we can see his infinite attributes. They're revealed in these. Yeah, excellent. Well, well said. Well said. Yeah. Anything else? I think one of the things that as we begin to look at the attributes, it gives us the important perspective that we're very small and God is very, 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 very big. And I don't mean that necessarily physically. I mean that in all of his greatness and his glory. It, it kind of starts us out with, okay, you know, we are dust on dust on dust on dust looking at the magnificent creator um, of the universe. So it's a good starting point um, for us. Well, definition, God's infinity means that he transcends all limitations of time and space. God um, transcends all limitations of time and space. Um, uh, I would even put it more basic. Um, infinite, the fact that God is infinite means that um, he has no limitations outside of himself. God has no limitations, none, zero. Um, now the question is, does God have any limitations? Does God have any limitations? Yes, God has limitations, and his limitations are himself. God is limited by his own character, right? He, he can't sin. Um, uh, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a, a man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God, it's impossible. God is limited. He cannot lie. But it's not because someone else has said, well, there's laws so that you can't do that. No, God himself, his very character, um, uh, God can't change. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is it that limits God? No one outside of God. God himself, his very character, 
is the grand limitation. Limita limit's not a good word because it makes us think as a negative. I'm not saying it as a negative, but it's that we can always trust him. God's not going to all of a sudden, this is okay one day and it's not the next day. No, he, he does have limitations, but he has no limitations outside of himself. That's the key. That's the key. Zach. Right. Because God is the creator of all things, he cannot be limited by anything. Exactly. And it comes back to the, the beginnings. Exactly. Well, not the next bullet there. God is eternal in that he, and this is the, I talked about infinity. Now we're, I'm transitioning to internal because they're, they're definitely related. God is eternal in that he transcends all limitations of time so that he is without beginning, without ending, and he is not limited by the moments of time. And so that's why we're considering these together. Um, the fact that God is eternal is because he's infinite in all of his, his attributes. Okay, well, that's the introduction. Let's look at basic theology. Um, don't be scared by the word theology. It's a great word. Um, we're all theologians. R.C. Sproul is in his uh, basic Bible doctrine book, he, he said we're all theologians. The question is, are you a good theologian or a bad theologian? Um, you're a theologian. Um, it's a great word. It means um, two Greek words, theos and logos. Logos, words, theos, God. Words about God. Uh, and that's what it is. And so we want to have a right theology, right words about God. So uh, I just have scriptures listed down there. Infinite, from scriptures. Uh, Romans 11, 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable, I love that. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. If you feel like this is unfathomable, you're in the right place. It is. For who has known the mind of the Lord? For who became his counselor? And so because God's nature is infinite, everything that flows out of it is infinite too. It says in the text that it's unsearchable, it's unfathomable. They're almost identical words. It, it really means incapable of being followed by footprints. You can't figure it out. Um, you, you can't, it's not just you can't comprehend it. Um, you can't even apprehend all the facts about God. God's ways and judgments are unfathomable. Uh, it, it's not saying that just what he does is unfathomable. You say, yeah, I don't know why God did that. No, it's saying more than that. It's not saying just what God does is unfathomable. It's saying God himself is unfathomable by finite minds. Look at Job 11, 7 through 8. It says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They're as high as the heavens. What can you do deeper than Sheol? What can you know? And so to say that God is infinite, say that he's, he's measureless. He has no limits. Uh, we've already mentioned he's infinite in all of his attributes, every one of them. And so this, this word infinite means that our God is beyond, beyond our, our conceptions. Uh, you know, our, our uh, quote, scientists talk about the ever-expanding universe because they're trying to because they have a problem. You understand why they have, they've had to say that? The reason they have had to say that is because um, they'll invent something they can see farther than they say the world um, uh, timeline exists. So they'll, they'll say, well, the world is this many years old, right? This many light years old, this many billion. And then, but then somehow we'll create something, not create something, we'll invent something, Hubble Space Telescope way out there. They, oh, it's actually farther than that. Well, it's just man trying to, to invent something. Our world, our universe is not infinite. It's not. Our universe is not infinite. Now, it's, it might as well be infinite for us because it's so, it, just, it would blow our mind to see actually how big it is, but it's not infinite because only God ultimately is infinite. God himself um, is uh, infinite. So that's infinite. has no limits, no limits to our, our great God, and it applies to all of his attributes. All of his attributes are, are infinite. So when we sing of God's sovereignty, when we sing of God's grace, when we sing of God's mercy, we are singing of a God that's infinitely gracious, infinitely merciful, beyond what we could ever imagine. Uh, and yet he wants us to lean into that. Well, let's look at eternal. Eternal, okay? So infinite is kind of the big picture. Now eternal is particularly as it relates to time. To time, okay? Time, okay? Now this, well, infinite beyond our understanding, but this one also is a, is a mind bender, okay? This one is a mind bender as well. Uh, I have a couple of statements there. God is the first and the last at the same time, okay? First and last at the same time. Isaiah 41, verse 4, prophet says, Who has performed and accomplished it? 
calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. God says, I am the first and the last. Now, when we read Scripture, we need to be really thoughtful and careful when we read it. Because a lot of times we'll read phrases like this, and, oh, okay, God says, I'm the first and the last, great. Um, now, it's hard to understand, but we need to lean into it. What does it mean when God says, I am the first and I am the last? What, what does that, that mean? Um, Notice what Isaiah doesn't say, what God doesn't say. He doesn't say, I was the first and I will be the last. That's what we would say, right? I was the first, I will be the last. That's what a human would have to say, something like that. God doesn't say that. He uses a present tense. Whoa, talking about the past. He uses a present tense talking about the the future. I know that's really causing your mind to go, woohoo, uh, but that's what he says. Uh, and this is, and see where it says um, capital O, capital R, capital D. What, why does it have that? What's that represent? What name of God? Yahweh, okay? In the name of God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, it was the name that the, the Jews were very careful to, um, to say or how they wrote it in God's word. Um, but that word is directly connected to uh, the Hebrew verb to exist. In other words, it has the idea of I am the self-existent one. I am the self-existent one who has always existed from eternity past to eternity future. What did, do you remember what Christ said in John 8, 58 that really sent the religious leaders to the roof that they, they immediately tried to stun him? What did he say? What did Christ call himself? Two words. Well, one word, actually. But what was it? What? He said, what did he say? Before Abraham was born, what? Then say I was. Before Abraham was born, I am. And they picked up rock because they knew exactly what he was claiming. He wasn't claiming I existed a long time ago. No, he was claiming I am God because only God is the self-existent one who has existed from eternity past to to eternity future. So God is the, the first and the last at the same time. I am the first and the last. What else? God existed before creation. Now this one's a little easier for us to understand. Still hard, but it's a little easier. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Talking about Christ, the living Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So, so Christ existed in eternity past. Um, now, this is really, well, I don't say really hard for um, humans to understand. It's impossible for humans to understand. We can kind of, you can kind of wrap your mind around something never e- ending in the future. I can kind of, okay, you know, because humans, every human that has ever existed will exist forever. Now, the question is, will they exist forever in the presence of God, or will they exist forever in eternal torment? The, the Bible is very clear. We will, every human will exist forever in eternity future. The thing that we have a really hard time with figuring it out, because we can't, is eternity past. Why? Because everything around you, everything that you know had a beginning, right? What's your birthday? Don't tell me, but you know exactly when your birthday was, right? That's when the, that's, now, we know you started when you were conceived, but from a human sense, you, when you're born, everyone knows. You ask a little kid, you know, once they get back, they know exactly when their birthday was. That's the most important day. This building, 1913, it's on a a little, it's on a brick thing right on the front of our building, exactly when it began. Your car, look at the inside of the car on that little doorpost, it'll tell you exactly the day when that car was built. Everything, everything that you know of, you know, everything, this pen, everything, you know, everything that in your life had a beginning, except God. God has existed from eternity past. We cannot conceive of that. Um, it's, it's far, far uh, beyond us to conceive of, but God had no beginning. He has been eternal. And that's why the next, uh, next uh, point I make is God is eternal. And by that I mean past and future. Uh, Revelation 15, 7, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Couldn't be more clear. God will live forever and ever. And then next one, God is from everlasting to everlasting. Top of the next page. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, 
In other words, before anything existed, from everlasting, even from everlasting, everlasting, you are God. So God was before everything, everything from eternity past to eternity future. He was and is God, everlasting, everlasting. Another point that I have, the next point there is God is the creator of time. I'm going to be real, this one's, this one's hard for us to understand. Why? Because, you know, everything in our life is so time-focused. You know, this class started at 9 o'clock, or kind of a little bit late, but, you know, we started at 9, 9 o'clock. Um, we all have, um, actually, I don't even wear a watch. I used to wear a watch. I just have, I just have my phone. It t- I mean, I'm, I'm checking all the time. Actually, I know a lot of times without even looking at what time it is, but uh, that's a disease. You know, it's not a good thing. Uh, but, you know, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? You know, what time is it? Oh, it's time to go to bed. You know, or whatever, time to eat, or whatever, time to do this, time to this. We're so driven by time, but God created time. Look at Genesis 1.1. I alluded to this when I preached through this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That little phrase, in the beginning, is what? That's the creation of time. It's when God created time. It's when he created time. 2 Peter 3.8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. Okay, Kind of get that. But then it goes the other. And a thousand years like one day. Oh, what? Uh, that's where it's saying, you know, and God created time. Sometimes theologians argue about, you know, is, is God in time or outside of time? Is there such a thing as time to God? A better way to, to consider this is God is the creator of time. God created time. As Lord, he's fully in control of it. And many times he chooses to operate within time. The plan of redemption, you know, we'll see next week, starts in Genesis chapter 3 where mankind falls, and then we have the cross, you know, in when Christ came. Now, th- that was within time. The cross didn't happen before the fall, right? God was operating within time, but he was over it. He created it. He was not limited by it. Um, he is sovereign over it. Uh, that, that's the key point, is that God is completely sovereign over time, he can function, and he chooses to function within the time that he's created, uh, just like he can choose to function within space as he's created, but he is in no way limited by it. Uh, he is no way limited by it at all, which helps us to understand sovereignty, right? I mean, a lot of these uh, attributes are related. When you understand that, it's like, oh, well, sovereignty is not an issue. You know, if you understand God is the creator of time, and he's in a sense outside of time in that sense on that, so... Okay, so that's a, a quick theology, a quick theology, the high points of the fact that God is infinite, and then applying it specifically to time, God is eternal. Well, let's talk about some practical implications, okay? What are some practical implications of God being infinite and eternal? Why don't you turn to the people right around you and talk to them? Well, in, light of what we just, in light of what we just discussed, God is infinite, God is eternal. What are some practical implications um, of that? Go. My mind hurts. That's what my practical... No, that's fine. I'm sorry. So what are some implications? What are the things you, from this? What's the implications of God being infinite, God being eternal? Pardon me? Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Yeah, boy. You can trust an, an infinite God. He will always be here. Yeah, if you look at the end of the book, the United States isn't there. Okay, now we, know, we don't know when that's going to happen, but, you know, there's going to come a point, you know, when, yeah, we're, it's not going to be here. Um, but our trust isn't in our country. Our trust isn't in our government. Our trust, like Andrew said, our trust is in a God who's eternal, infinite. Great observation, trust. Good. What else? 
Implication. Implication. Yeah, Joe. Okay. And as you point out, people were just going to church. Okay. For those that he had blessed with the hope of eternal redemption, it's impossible. Okay. So the thing it is that we can grab that. Okay. Right now. Eternal world, her own yeah. world. Yeah, God created time, like Joe said. God created time, and so that he is sovereign over that. Um, the Lion King is wrong. There is no circle of life. Um, <laughs> don't get your theology from Disney. You'll be in trouble. Uh, uh, there, it, it's linear. Time is linear. God is very clear. There's a beginning. There's an end. But God is eternal, and we can trust him in the middle of that. And we need to follow his plan on how to be with him forever. Great observation. Someone else? Yeah. Heather. Excellent. Excellent. And that's one of my goals from this first, for this first class is that we would not be satisfied with our current knowledge or awareness or relationship with God. Uh, there should always be a sense, I read a book one time, it talked about Christians should be the most content people, but the least content people. The most content because we have Christ, we have everything. The least content because we're never satisfied, like Heather said, with our relationship with God. We always want to press into it. We always want more of knowing God. Um, this should create a, oh, there's so much more. You know, it's like you came to, let's say you came to a, a table and it was a great feast, grand feast. There's all your favorite food, filet mignon and everything, if, that, if that's your favorite food. But uh, everything's there, you know, all the steaks and soups and salads and whatever you like. It's just, the table is filled. But then there's just a little cracker, then you see it's a little cracker. That's all you ate, water and cracker. Well, no, that we would say, oh, no, all this. That's that we would be, we, we would kind of, Pull our, pull our chair up to the table, right? Okay, I'm saying, you know, pull your chairs up to the table. Let's get up to the table and let's eat at the feast of God and who he is and his glory. That, that's so true in, in that. And how do you acquire a taste for God and his greatness and his glory? Feast on him, right? How do you even acquire a taste for certain foods as you feast on them, right? You delight in them. That's the same with us. You, you, you don't just say, God, give me a desire for you, but then I don't feed. No, I feed that. I feed that. And that's, that's a great observation. Other things. I've listed a couple down there. Um, implications first for our relationship with God. One, we will never exhaust seeking to know the depths of God, even in eternity. Even in eternity, you will not say, oh, okay, now I know everything about God. No, no. Uh, you will never exhaust the depths. It's, you know, let's say I, I, I enjoy reading. You know, just, there's so many great books. And I'm like, oh, that was a great book. Oh, you know, I, I just reread Tale of Two Cities. I've read a lot of Dickens in the last couple months. Um, Tale of Two Cities, great book. Great, talks about the, you know, fallenness of man and all kinds of stuff, but, oh, it's a great book. But you know what? There's, you don't have to be limited. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have read it because I want to read something. No, there's, God will never, you'll never exhaust the, the wonder in the, that you can find in the presence and the person of God. That's why we need eternity. Another implication for your relationship is all of God's attributes, love, mercy, grace, goodness, ongoing or infinite, which should cause us to overflow in awe and worship of him. I mean, they're all infinite. We should just be overflowing in wonder and worship and awe and fear of him, press into them. And then thirdly, we must be very careful about our human tendencies to put limitations on God. Beloved, we limit God, don't we? Well, when you worry, what's the problem? You're limiting God, you know? Whenever we sin, we're limiting God in some way. God can't satisfy me. I need to do this. It's a, we, we, when we understand who God is, we don't need to limit him. Implication of our daily lives, we can completely trust, and Andrew mentioned this one, we can completely trust a God who has no limitations. You can completely trust him. Um, he is sovereign over everything. He is over all time, over all space. Um, we, struggle, we struggle with God because we limit him, right? That's it. If we didn't limit God, we wouldn't struggle with trusting him. Another one, we need to have no fear of tomorrow or anything in the future because God is outside of time and sovereign over it. Um, uh, nothing that happens in this life, nothing catches God off guard. He, he knows the end from the beginning. His sovereignty over all things is a sweet comfort. And in our body, in the last month, we've had a lot of reminders of that, right? Deep reminders of that that we can trust. We don't have to fear tomorrow because we know God is in control. And then the last thing there, we must cultivate an eternal perspective that lives this momentary life in line of eternity with God. Uh, 
Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So we need to live in light of um, eternity. So there's some practical um, implications. And I trust that you press into these. I really encourage you, uh, if you're married, you know, we, we encourage discipleship groups when we went to the bookends. This would be a great thing for you to talk about this with someone else. Talk through this. You know, let's talk about what we just in, in class and how is this affecting us? Are we living in light of an eternal, infinite God? Or are we really kind of limited our God? Talk about one another. Pray for one another that God would grow you into these things. There's a great song I don't know if you're familiar with. We're not going to sing it. I was tempted to sing it, but I won't sing it. Um, no, I'm not going to sing it. It's a great song. Um, actually, Marge gave this. Um, it was during a kind of a challenging time. I think it was about 2004 or something. Marge gave this, you know, a little card to Martha. Martha carried it with her for years. It's a sweet, sweet song. Let me just read it to you and, because it really reflects on God's infiniteness. It's, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To add an affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. And then, this is the chorus. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And that's the God we can trust. Let me pray. Take some time right now and talk to the Lord. Reflect on His infinite grace. And then I'll close our time in prayer. O oh God, You giveth and giveth and giveth again. Um, out of your infinite, infinite attributes. And I pray that we, your people, uh, we would be um, convicted of our limiting of you and then we'll be overwhelmed by your infinite greatness. And now that, that would cause us to be individuals, to be families, to be a church that displays you, that puts you on display, not us. And we long for that, that we would be overcome with your greatness, overcome with your glory. And it would so touch our lives that we would reflect you and powerful ways. We trust you for that. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, next week, we're going to look at a small topic, the Trinity, <laughs> the unity and diversity within the Trinity. So I trust you'll come prepared for that. So take a little break, and we'll see you in about 20 minutes. And if you have kids, you need to make sure and get your kids. <laughs> Don't forget them up there. Uh, the uh, child care workers really appreciate that.